Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. We've got an interesting video for you this week. I had some really interesting discussions with Professor Nathan Mock, who's a valuation expert, but he also conducts a lot of research on economics and economic principles at large. And he's currently working with some colleagues on some research talking about industries and companies that might benefit from interest rate cuts. And of course, we've had our first interest rate cut now. So what I've done, I've asked Nathan to put together a video with some thoughts on the subject, and he's going to cover some industries that he think will benefit from an interest rate cut. But he's also going to talk about some specific stocks that he's found that also have good fundamentals and for the most part, really good valuation metrics. So I'm going to turn it over to Nathan and let him share his thoughts on what companies and what industries can prosper and benefit and why in an interest rate cut. Nathan? So after the Federal Reserve's recent rate cut decision, a lot of folks have had questions about maybe which stocks or which sectors might be better suited to benefit from the cut. And I think it's a real interesting question. I want to share a few thoughts generally and then give some specific companies that I think could be in a position to benefit from a lower interest rate environment. And maybe the first thing I point out is anytime we're looking at stocks and valuation, the fundamentals are dynamic. So both at the firm level and at the macro level, things are changing. So I think it makes sense to pay attention to these types of events. That said, we don't want to really read maybe too much into any one of these events because companies that are set to benefit from lower interest rate doesn't necessarily mean that those are overall the companies that will outperform all others. It's just who really stands to, to gain here. And so a couple things I'd point out is if you look at history overall with stocks, what happens after a rate cut depends on the overall economic situation. So if we are in a recession or on the cusp of a recession, the rate cuts are not associated with very good returns. However, if the rate cuts are more what we consider a normalization or a response to some sort of crisis, the returns have been better. So here's an interesting article from Reuters that gets into this a little bit. I'll show you one chart in particular, but the recession factor it says. So this is change in S&P three, six, and 12 months after a rate cut. And you see we've had normalizations in 89, 95, and 2019 panic cuts in 87, 98, and March of 2020, and then the recession cuts from 90, 01, and 07. And so again, fall, if, it's, if we're talking about recession period, uh, those are negative numbers. If we're talking about normalization or panic, they are positive numbers. So I think a key question, obviously, to ask yourself as you do your own due diligence and your own research on this is uh, what you think about this factor of are we on the cusp of a recession? Are we going to have a soft landing? Are we going to have a hard landing? Certainly a lot of opinions out there on this, but I do think it is critical to understanding what the impact of the rate cut is going to be. The next thing I'd really think about is really which industries or sectors maybe have historically done the best in rate cut environments, especially the first rate cut of a cycle, which is really where we're at. Sometimes we'll see cuts follow each other, but the first cut can be a significant time. And what we saw in 95, that was one of those normalization rate cuts that might be in some ways more similar to this one than some of these other periods. We saw healthcare and telecom did really well. Also, if we just look over the past, IT has done well in soft landing type of situations, consumer staples, utilities. These have all done pretty well during following a first rate cut. So that's certainly something I would look at. Um, I would say s as far as firm specifics, who is in a position to benefit from a rate cut? I would really say firms with a lot of debt, because if those interest payments are using up a lot of their free cash, then the lower interest rate environment should really be an advantage to those firms reduce their interest expense especially firms that have an ongoing need for debt. So they're going to need to issue debt continuously. Moving forward, they'll be able to issue in a lower interest rate environment. So I'm looking for firms that have fairly high debt loads, but otherwise I like the fundamentals. The other thing I'd say is if the consumers for a firm would benefit from the low interest rate environment, those are also firms that are going to be interesting. So I'll give you some specifics that I think are interesting, but as always, you definitely want to do your own due diligence. And again, keep in mind that 
just because the interest rate cut might have some advantage, this doesn't sort of absolve us from figuring out valuation and understanding the fundamentals of the business. So just because a firm is relatively better off after a rate cut, we still have to kind of decide for ourselves, overall, are they in good shape and are they in a position to perform well? So three healthcare stocks. The first one is AbV. There's a lot to like when you look at the earnings history of AbV. A little dip coming out of 22 into 23. Expectations are to be pretty high. This is one that, although there, I think there is a lot to like about AbV, probably the biggest caution here that I see immediately is you know, this black line, the price line, is above the value line. And so that means that currently AbV trading at a higher multiple than it has during the, the period shown on this graph. That's an 18.03 blended PE currently, which is still cheap relative to, say, SPY, which if we pop over there is 24. So the S&P trading at quite a bit higher PE than ABV is right now. But ABV trading at a higher multiple relative to its own history. Still though, a nice dividend yield of 3.15%. When we look at the financial statements and we check out the balance sheet, we see that this is a firm with about 52 billion in long-term debt. So again, firms that might stand to benefit from an interest rate cut, firms with a lot of debt, and that certainly describes ABV. If we take a look at the forecasting calculator, again, I think this is probably the best way to help you make decisions in a really simple way. You can see that if ABV hits these different earnings estimates, what kind of return would you be looking at different multiples? And so again, if they revert back to maybe more what they've traded at historically, a 15 PE, you see the annualized return of about four and a half percent there. If they hang in closer to this 18 the multiple they're at, that's more like an annualized return of 12%. That's a total return. This has a nice yield, but also some potential upside if that multiple holds, if those estimates are realized. So AbV is the first healthcare company on my list. Up next is J&J. &J. So J&J, &J, really a similar, all three of the healthcare stocks have a similar story. J&J &J really in between the blue and orange lines currently. So that would be a key difference between AbV. The expected growth, when you look at what analysts are projecting for 25 and 26, not as strong as AbV still a reasonable amount of growth. Dividend yield of 3.06, so pretty nice dividend yield. J&J is a AAA rated company, so rated at a very high level on financial health. If we take a look again at their financial statements, we go to their balance sheet, we see that this is a company that has about $26 billion in long-term debt, which compared to their market cap of $390 almost billion dollars, relatively minor, but again, healthcare has been a sector that's done well in rate cut environments. So J&J &J certainly fits within that and has reasonable fundamentals. If we take a look at the forecasting calculator, and again, we can run this out at a 15 multiple, at a 1650 multiple, we can see the annualized return suggested by that. The third healthcare company I want to take a look at is Pfizer. So Pfizer on the graph, one thing that definitely stands out here is this huge spike up and then falling back down. And so that was their COVID portfolio generated some extra profits, some extra revenues for a period that declined. One thing that I think you'll find if you look into some of their own reports is they talk about the results in 23 the non-COVID portfolio was still growing a bit during that period, but the drop-off of the COVID-related sales really is why you see this spike up and spike down. But again, pretty good growth expected. We're almost at the end of 24, so we're getting pretty close to those numbers, finding out what those actually are. Again, very nice dividend yield on Pfizer, especially compared to the other two healthcare stocks we looked at. An A-rated company. We take a look at their financial statements, go into the balance sheet. We can see total debt here of about 64 billion. And that's on a market cap of about 162 billion. So a little more debt, especially compared to J&J &J relative to the market value of the equity. But a lot of debt, healthcare company may benefit from a lower interest rate. I'd also say 
is we especially start to get into these higher dividend yields, like this 5.86%. In a lower interest rate environment, that tends to impact the money market rates that we can get. And so as we start to find lower interest rates and sort of safe haven type investments, some of these yields might look, relatively speaking, a little bit more attractive. And that is, I think, one of the interesting things about Pfizer. I want to switch gears to utilities. So utilities are heavily regulated. And they're kind of an interesting industry to get familiar with if you're not already. I'm going to take a look at UGI first, which is a pretty good example of what you'll see with a lot of utilities. But high dividend yield, relative at least to most equities at this stage of a 6.12%. Most utilities tend to have a lot of debt, and certainly UGI is in that camp. If we go to their balance sheet, and take a look at their debt. That's about 6.8 billion. And that is on compared to a market cap of about 5 billion. So this is a fairly debt heavy business. Utilities are fairly debt heavy, presumably part of the reason that maybe historically they've done fairly well following a first rate cut. And again, they have a need to spend on physical assets on an ongoing basis. So they're gonna have an ongoing need to borrow finance capex there's going to be some limit to their ability to change pricing because of how they're regulated so a lot of times you see low growth numbers much like what you see for them so that's pretty typical in general maybe more of a dividend play here on ugi because of that very low growth however ugi is trading at a very low pe so their current blended pe is about an 8.37 whether or not you want to bet on a expansion of that multiple is really your call, but you can take a look at the forecasting calculator and just see if they hang about where they're at now, what your total return would look like. Historically, they have traded at a little bit of a higher multiple than that. If they got up into the, the 10 and a half range, maybe that's what you would see there. So UGI, again, I think a pretty typical example, the black line fell below the value line starting kind of early 23 and has sort of plateaued at more of a new normal which is a much much lower multiple hard to know when or if those will change but that's certainly something worth looking at i think one other thing i want to talk about with ugi is i'm showing adjusted operating earnings if we go to just a basic earnings we'll actually see a negative number for 23 and so it's only when we look at an adjusted earnings that we get a positive number. And again, you, you'd want to take a look here and see for yourself what you think about that adjustment. But a lot of that adjustment was due to losses in derivatives for UGI, losses on their commodity derivatives, and also an impairment they took to the propane business. So again, the adjusted operating earnings graph looks a little smoother and more consistent than if you look at the basic earnings. And I'd encourage you to dig into that further to see for yourself what you think. The second utility is Eversource Energy. So really stable earnings growth here. You know, if you look through 2014 to present day and beyond, it's about five or six percent, just pretty predictably. So that's overall fairly low growth rate, but for a utility, fairly solid. They've got a dividend yield of about 4.2%. This is, again, a company with a lot of debt. And so if you look at their financial statement and go to the total debt, it's about 24 billion. And that's 24 billion in debt compared to a market cap of about 24 billion. So that gives you some idea of why they may benefit from an interest rate cut. And trading right on the, the yellow line here, which they spent some time above the blue line. And then earlier they were kind of in between the two. So if we take a look at the forecasting calculator and just run that out to the yellow line, you can get a, an idea of the total return and annualized return there. And again, the dividend yield are really helping prop that up because the growth is relatively low and these higher dividend yields, again, might be more attractive in a lower interest rate environment. Another industry that has fared well following the first rate cut historically, especially in more normalizing periods, as opposed to recessionary periods, and telecom has done well. And so I'll take a look at a couple companies within telecom, we'll start with Verizon. So first of all, Verizon has had some negative adjusted earnings growth recently. 
which is probably partly related to the fact that the black line is so far below the value line. So blended PE of about 9.79 right now. And again, probably part of the reason for that very low multiple is we've had declining earnings for a couple of years projected for 24, and then back to some light growth in, in 25 and 26. So some things to consider there, nice dividend yield of 5.99%. On all of these, looking at dividend safety makes a lot of sense, but you can just look at, that's about 58% of the earnings that they're paying out. This is a firm that produces quite a bit of cash. It's also a firm that has a lot of debt, which is a theme with a lot of these stocks. And if we take a look at their long-term debt, that's about $157 billion compared to a market cap of about $190 billion. So both in absolute and relative terms, that's a, a big number on the, the debt front. Again, one of the potential points of interest with Verizon is it is at a low multiple maybe it's possible they return to more of their historical normal. Maybe they stay low. That's what the forecasting calculator lets us run out those scenarios to see that if the multiple stays relatively low, that's what our total return would look like. If the multiple returns back to what we see on the longer term history, that's what the return looks like. And again, the dividends helping to really drive those returns for Verizon. And AT&T, very similar to Verizon, trading in a very similar multiple. Similarly, have seen a drop in earnings, flat earnings in 22, drop in 23, expect a drop in 24, back to low growth. So it looks very similar to Verizon. Not surprisingly, they operate in the same industry. Dividend yield for AT&T is about a 5%. Again, this is a firm with a lot of debt. We take a look at their total debt on the balance sheet. We will see that they have about 145 billion in long-term debt, and that's compared to a market cap of about 158 billion. Their forecasting calculator is going to look pretty similar to what we saw with Verizon in terms of if this is what the return looks like if they hold at their current multiple, they get back to their historical norm. That's what you're looking at here. So again, I think both with Verizon and AT&T, the potential for interest would be a healthy yield getting back to some growth after some years of negative growth and very low multiples combined with the fact that maybe the rate cut environment is helpful to them given their large levels of debt and the fact that telecom has historically done well following a rate cut. So another industry that has historically done well following rate cuts is real estate. And so take a look at a couple of REITs here. One thing I'll point out is while I was looking at adjusted operating earnings before, it's always good to look at different multiples but for REITs, operating cash flow is how it shows up here. You see the FFO, that's funds from operations. And this is one of the common multiples folks use to value REITs. And so that's what I have up here. This is Realty Income. Realty Income has had pretty consistent, relatively low growth. So about a 5.23% growth over this period. Dividend yield of about 5%. It's an A- minus credit rating. Again, if we take a look at their financials and take a look at their debt levels, um, there's 20 billion in long-term debt compared to a market cap of about 54 billion. So a lot of debt, a lot of thinking that real estate has benefited in the past in a rate cut environment, a lower rate environment, and might continue to do so here. So we'll take a look at the forecasting calculator. We see right now realty income right on the yellow line. So we'll take a look at that. You can see what the total return looks like if they hold at that yellow line. They have hopped a, a, above that line historically, and so we can take a look just a little bit, a little bit above and a little bit below to see what we could be looking at there. But realty income is a pretty consistent earning, pretty consistent low earnings growth re with a pretty solid dividend yield. A lot of debt might benefit from lower interest rates. The next read is triple N and trading at a very similar price to funds from operations as realty income was. So right around that 15 mark currently, 4.77% dividend yield. And again, like AT&T and Verizon were pretty similar, realty income and triple N are also pretty similar. When we look at the forecasting calculator, we'll see kind of the same, roughly the same expected annualized returns if they hold at this at this current multiple. Again, quite a bit of debt in the real estate space stands to benefit from potentially from these rate cuts.
And then the final in a show I want to look at is IT. And I've got maybe a little bit of a wild card compared to the other stocks I've taken a look at here today in Dell. So Dell does pay a dividend, but at 1.57% is a little bit lower than the other stocks that I've taken a look at. And again, part of the reason of looking for these dividend yielders is with the idea that possibly when interest rates are lower and the ability to get these higher rates we've enjoyed in money market and similar type of investments, as those returns look a little bit lower, these dividend yields might look a little more attractive. This would be more of a total return story, certainly, potentially. Also, if we just look at this graph, an immediate caution is this blue line is on this graph is the PE at which Dell has traded. And of course, although Dell's been around for a while, the history is relatively limited here because they went private for a period and then they went back to being public. So that's uh, why we don't see the sort of the full Dell history is where we don't have the, the data from when they're private. So since they've been publicly traded, you can see through about June of 23, they sort of oscillated around this six PE, which is a very, very low PE. They've now bounced back up closer to the orange line, but certainly a big part of thinking about Dell is really thinking about which multiple maybe makes more sense. Again, we saw the S&P trading up in the 20s. We started with ABV at about an 18. Multiples tend to vary based on growth and risk. And so we've seen some lower PEs from firms on the, the list today. And a lot of that is because they are very low growth. But although Dell has had a little bit of some negative in 22 and negative in 24, expected to have double digit earnings growth moving forward for the next few years. So that's pretty interesting. Anytime that the growth is a big part of things, I do like to take a look at the analyst scorecard and they've got a history of meeting or beating other than 22 since they've been back to being publicly traded so reasonable performance there on how they've done relative to analyst forecasts and again a big driver of what you think about dell is going to depend on if they hang in at the orange line here if that's where they trade and hit their estimates you see the projected annualized return of about 21 percent but we've seen historically they've been at that eight. And so there's some possible downside if that eight is closer to reality. So spending some time to get comfortable with what, where you think Dell might be headed on that front makes a lot of sense. But again, Dell in the IT space, which has done well following rate cuts. And this is a company that has a fair bit of debt as well. If we look at their total debt, it's about 19 and a half billion. That compares to a market cap of about 37 billion. So not as debt heavy as, for instance, the utilities that we looked at, but certainly uh, quite a bit of debt that could benefit Dell. So just to wrap up, these interest rate cuts really do represent a chance to maybe rethink where the equity markets might be headed generally, where certain sectors might be headed, and then some specific stocks. And my general approach would be to look at history to see who has done well historically following rate cuts. Also to think a little bit about the context of the rate cuts, meaning is it a recession or is it more of a normalization type of period because we've seen different results. And then you're looking at firms that would benefit from the rate cut. And the most obvious way to benefit is by having lower interest expense, making their debt cheaper. So firms with a lot of debt might benefit. And then finally, higher dividend yields might be relatively more attractive to some folks in an era where the less risky interest bearing type of investments like money markets are paying out a little lower rates potentially. Thanks, Nathan. That was excellent. You know, there's some really interesting stocks there for you all to look at and do some of your own research and due diligence on. But also some of the principles about the effects that interest rates can have on stocks in general and certain industries in particular, I thought were fascinating. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, give us a like, ring the bell, and you know, subscribe to the channel if you don't already. And by the way, take a look at subscribing to FastGrass because they sure can help you and become a better long-term investor in common stocks. Thanks for watching.